working. Can you hear me back there? Hello, my name is John Merkel, and I have the pleasure of directing the J. Philip Center for Interfaith Learning, which is the sponsor for this afternoon's program. And with that comes the pleasure of welcoming all of you here and giving a very special welcome to our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Bradley Mokowski, who is here from the University of Notre Dame, where he is professor of comparative religion uh, there, teaching courses that have to do with the religions of India, particularly with uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, and with Christianity in relation to those religions. And he's one of the most prominent scholars in the field of comparative religion, and it's just a very great honor to have him here. Um, his most recent book is called God's Other Children. You, I, you can see we uh, took the cover of this book for the poster that you saw around campus. The subtitle, Personal Encounters with Faith, Love, and Holiness in Sacred India. And uh, so that's the title of his book, the title of today's lecture. He's going to share a lot from this. And about this book, perhaps the most prominent scholar in the world of comparative religion, Houston Smith, says that it is the most interesting and inspiring book that I have read in a very long time. And there are many other prominent scholars who have been saying like things about this magnificent book. And, and though I'm no Houston Smith in the field of comparative religion, I uh, give it my endorsement as well for whatever that is worth. But I just benefited immensely from reading this this past summer, so much so that I thought I'm going to, we, I've, I've known Brad before, and I thought I'm just going to uh, call him immediately, tell him how much I like the book and how much I'd love him to come to St. Thomas uh, to lecture on this. And um, so um, I should just add, I'm not going to say too much more because uh, Brad's uh, presentation this afternoon is very autobiographical, so I don't have to say much of an introduction. But he is, uh, and has been for a long time, the editor of uh, the Journal of Hindu Christian Studies. Um, he received his uh, master's and doctoral degrees at one of the most prestigious schools of theology in the world, at uh, the University of Tübingen in Germany. He also studied, studied Sanskrit and Hindu thought at the University of Pune in India. He has uh, a great background to be sharing what is a perfect fit for our center, the J. Philip Center for Interfaith Learning. Uh, our our uh, mission is to foster uh, interfaith learning, friendship, and service. And uh, what Dr. Bradley Malkowski does um, fits perfectly with what we are attempting to do at the center. I want to thank uh, my colleague Hans Gustafsson, who did so much to make this afternoon possible. And before I uh, turn it over to Dr. Malkowski, um, Dr. Uh, McMillan wants to, McMillan wants to um, make an announcement. Good afternoon. This is addressed to Dr. Sanander's students. There will be sign-up sheets for you after the presentation. There are multiple sheets and they will be on that table. So sign in as you leave, all right? Thank you, Dr. Mokowski. Before, okay, before I begin, I see a number of people in the back who don't have chairs. Here's a place, here's a place, a couple more here. So why don't you come forward and sit down because otherwise you'll be standing for over an hour. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay? Is that okay? <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to thank uh, John and the J. Phillips Center for inviting me here. Uh, and I'd like to also make mention of the fact this is my first visit to the University of St. Thomas. I am very impressed because it's not only a beautiful campus, but it seemed like everywhere I walked this afternoon on campus, people were greeting me in such a friendly way. 
So there's a special spirit here that I've already learned to appreciate in the short time that I've been here. So congratulations on having such a great campus. <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking about today is my own journey from not having any religion at all to becoming a Catholic and to becoming a Catholic that has learned to recognize the work of God in other religions that has raised all kinds of questions in my own mind about theology, some of which I cannot answer. But I wanted to bear witness to what I've seen as a Christian to other people who may not have had that, uh, uh, that opportunity to go to India out of curiosity. And I know some people are from India, so I'm not going to ask you. One of you has been to India many times. How many people here have been to India? A few of you, not many of you. OK, so here we go. Uh, this here is the cover of the book. And you'll see that uh, you, have a, well, it's not, you have a picture of the Buddha. You have a picture of a man praying in Islam. You have a Hindu goddess here. Who, who is this? Uh, this is my wife when she was 16, before I got to know her, when she was raised as a Muslim. And she is one of the wisest people that I know. And I know I'm biased. She's my wife. But I just had to get that in. OK. And now, I wanted to mention that uh, I didn't go to college until I was 21, because I had all kinds of questions in high school about the meaning of life that I was not getting answers to in high school. So I thought, why should I go to college? They're not going to give me any answers either. So I basically did all kinds of things, like uh, living in the Southwest. I'm from upstate New York. But I went to the Southwest for what I thought would be four months, trying to avoid the winter. And I stayed two and a half years uh, in the Southwest. I became a Catholic at that time by reading the works of Thomas Merton. And people of the older generation will know the value of reading Thomas Merton. I hope some of the younger people know the name. He's Catholicism's most famous Catholic spirit, most famous spiritual writer in English in the 20th century. One of the places I ended up was here, at the Monastery of Christ in the Desert in New Mexico. I went there for a week, and I stayed almost a year. Because when you don't have debt, you can do that. You can stay where you want to stay. And during the time that I was there, the monks, there were only five monks at the time living there, they said, one of the things we're going to do this winter, because we don't have a lot of work to do of working in the fields, because there's snow on the fields now, is we're going to listen to a bunch of recordings from people of other religions and le learn what we can find out and uh, enrich ourselves with from that experience of hearing about Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, et cetera. So I said, I just became a Catholic. I don't want to start thinking about other religions at this point, because I'll just be confused. They said, that's fine. You can leave. So I said, OK, let's go. So I started learning about other religions. And in fact, I ended up extremely confused. But I recognized from the kind of lectures I heard from a Hindu master and a Buddhist, et cetera, that these people had also made experiences of God. And they were speaking with authority about the greatness of their religions. I just didn't have a theology yet to figure out what I might want to do with that exposure to other religions. So I lived there for a while. <clears throat> and then I came to St. John's University. You might have heard of St. John's, right? <laughs> Boo, right? <clears throat> I went there for two years as a philosophy and German major. And during the time that I, I was there, I also practiced yoga in the Twin Cities uh, with a man that Professor Ulrich also knows very well. We have the same roots in Hinduism. And I was very impressed by the holiness of this man, which raised even further questions in my mind. So what happened then is I simply ran out of money. I, didn't, I don't have an American degree. But I was able to go uh, to Germany on an overseas program where I thought I was going to stay for three or four months. I stayed eight years instead of three or four months. Every couple of years, I'd return home and visit my parents again. And one of the places, the place where I studied the most is called the University of Tübingen which is, at that time, was certainly one of the great centers of theology. And uh, in a university population of 22,000, about a tenth of the students were studying theology. It was really a great and exciting time to study theology. Two thirds of them were Protestant. One third were Catholic. I got my first Catholic degree there, but I also took a lot of Protestant theology classes. This was one of my teachers, Walter Kasper. Uh, some of you will know the name. The younger generation, probably not so much. I was his research assistant for three years. I came to know him well. 
Uh, he received an honorary doctorate uh, from, at Notre Dame some years ago, and he's come again recently to visit our university. And one of the things about Casper that most people don't know, when they think about him, they think about his book on Christology, his book on Trinity. But what people don't know is just before he became a bishop and then a cardinal, he had also attended a conference on Hindu-Christian dialogue in Vienna. And he was very excited about the dialogue with Hinduism, about the mystery of God about experiencing God in a different way in Hinduism than is done in Christianity. Unfortunately, uh, becoming a bishop didn't give him the time now to continue doing that. And then this is another, this is another person I study with, uh, Hans Kuhn, uh, who will not be a cardinal anytime soon, <laughs> right? if you know who Hans Kuhn is. Uh, but I also learned a lot from him. And one of the things about Kuhn is that he was one of the first systematic theologians in Germany to actually seriously undertake investigating other religions. And there are reasons for that I don't want to explain that are mostly political. But uh, he wrote a very famous book called Christianity and World Religions, which I think is still definitely worth looking at if you have questions about how does all of this relate to Christ, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. So he was very important. Uh, here's a, just a quick overview of about world religions percentage-wise. Uh, we see Christianity here. This is who knows for sure, right? 31% or so of Christians. Uh, the next largest group is Islam with 23%. Hindus are 15%. The Muslims would probably like to switch these numbers. It all depends on who's doing the compiling. Muslims tend to say there are twice as many Muslims in the world as there are Christians. I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that question. Uh, you can see here, right here, there's a, a red dot with the city of Pune, also spelled P-O-O-N-A. It's a center of learning for both Hinduism and Christianity in India. And this is where I went eventually. I spent eight years in Germany. And then I thought I was going to go to India for a year to research a dissertation on a very famous Hindu thinker. I thought I was going to go for one year. I stayed five years. OK? My parents are thinking, when is this boy coming home? Right? OK. So. Um, Oh, this, is, this tells you a little bit now about the population division in India. Uh, 80, over 80% 80 of the population of India is Hindu. So it's everywhere you go, you'll see Hinduism. But notice also that the second largest religion here is Islam, 13% of the population. That may not seem like much, but when you compare the populations of Islam around the world, we now know, as of statistics taken last week, that India now has the second largest Muslim population in the world, even though it's only 13% of the population of India. What's the first population, number one, do you know? Indonesia. Indonesia is the number one, OK? Now, um, I was going to mention something else about this population. I got off track here. Oh, yeah, so what this means then is this. In India, people don't speak Arabic. So the people who are Muslim, they speak a multitude of local languages. And, that, and this is typical of, of here in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, the four largest countries of the world that are Muslim, or they have a large Muslim population, which tells us that the population center of Islam is South and Southeast Asia. It is not the Middle East. More than 80% of the world's Muslims do not speak Arabic. And yet, in India, they will say their prayers in Arabic, and they will greet each other in Arabic, but they do not uh, speak Arabic with each other. And I'll, I'll get a, a little bit later, I'll talk about how they study the Quran also. OK, so now this is the man I wanted to study in India. His name is Shankara, who lived around the year 700. And he is Hinduism's most famous thinker. He's also very controversial, because instead of talking about God's love, although he does talk about God's compassion sometimes, really what he's about is practicing meditation and awakening to the divine presence within in a state of what is called pure consciousness, which requires the death of the ego and which requires practice of compassion along the way. But it's a different kind of experience than the experience of, of a god of love. And yet it's a very, very liberating experience. He wrote many, many books. And he wrote his most important book at the age of 16, uh, which is about 800 pages long, which is used all over the Hindu world. But I didn't have time. I don't have time to tell you more about him now because it's really not about him. Uh, in the state of Maharashtra, where that city of Pune is located, uh, are people called Varkaris. I'm not pronouncing it right because I don't speak Marathi. 
But these people worship uh, Krishna in, in the form of what is called Vitoba. And they go on pilgrimage. And they go on pilgrimage by the thousands. I, I've seen 20,000 at once coming into the city of Pune. And these are mostly poor people, farmers, not so well educated, but they have a strong devotion to God. And most of the poetry is about the love of God revealed in Krishna. And so they will memorize hundreds of songs, hundreds of, poetry, uh, of poems, and they will be chanting them all day long as they walk. I'm trying to get this to. I'm not sure why this is not working now. There we go. There's the next picture, another view of, the, of these pilgrims. So this is what we would call popular devotional Hinduism, not as opposed to the kind of Hinduism for scholars that, and monks that Shankar is about. These are married people for the most part, and they're on pilgrimage now. And everywhere they go, Hindus open up their homes to have them come and spend the night before they continue their journey. Uh, they're known for their love of music. This is uh, just one example of the thousands of musicians that are traveling uh, as Hindus worshiping God. I remember when I was a student in uh, India years ago, uh, I remember riding my bicycle regularly through the streets of Pune around midnight when it was very quiet in the city. And I'd go by this little shrine, and every time I went by, there would be a gathering of old men with long white hair with their instruments, and they would begin their chanting and singing to God at midnight. I never stayed around to see how long they were going to sing, but they might have been singing till dawn. I don't know. But I was very impressed by their devotion to God, totally convinced of God's love. Okay, uh, some of you who know yoga may know the name of Iyengar. He's probably the most famous teacher of yoga in the 20th century. He died in August of this year in his 90s. Uh, this represents another form of Hinduism, another form of spirituality, uh, classical yoga. And I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be aiming this thing. I'm going to aim it over here. Okay, uh, there he is now as an old man. Uh, he. Uh, has written a very, very famous book that I do recommend called Light on Yoga, which is filled with about 500 photographs of yoga practice and also tells you what asanas or postures to do for what ailment, physical ailment you may have. Uh, some time ago, earlier this year, uh, a well-known Catholic scholar at Harvard, uh, a Jesuit named Frank Clooney, visited him, and he said, and I don't know if you know about this, Ted, he, he visited, uh, Clooney visited Iyengar, and Iyengar said, I had gone... I went to Rome in the 1980s, and I met John Paul II, the Pope. And he told Iyengar, I wish I could have learned yoga. You would have been my teacher. This is said by a pope. I don't think it's ever been said by any other pope. I wish I could have studied yoga with a Hindu master. Uh, one of the things that we need to think about with the practice of yoga is how important are the basic moral commands of yoga. These are the moral commands. Nonviolence, truthfulness, non-stealing, sexual control, and not hoarding things. And many Westerners practice yoga, and they focus on the postures and on the meditation, but they overlook the moral, com the moral commandments. And yoga teaches holiness is not simply attaining a state of mind which is mentally calm, but it's also attaining a state beyond ego and all selfishness. And so even without the moral commandments, you can go pretty far, but you can't reach the goal in the spiritual life without the practice of these five commandments here. Okay. And then we have what is called Hindu Prasad. These are food offerings to God, blessed by a priest, uh, accepted by God through the priest, and then when you re receive them back, this is now blessed food that you can eat. And when you eat it, you're actually communing with God. This is not the same thing as the Eucharist, where we say that God, according to some kind of theology about the Eucharist, where God enters into the elements. Here we have the blessing on the food. It's a different theology. But the understanding is God desires to draw near to us in the sharing of a meal. Now this raises questions, because many Hindus uh, will be attracted to going to other uh, places of other religions in order to receive the power and the blessing that they think is going to be there through those other religions and those other places. So Hindus are known not to just be doing a pilgrimage to their own places. They will also go on visits to other places. And then the question is, 
when they come to Hindu or to Christian places, will they be able to receive communion? Because they regard this as 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 a as per, this is called prasad, actually. Oh, there it is, prasad. Um, the blessed food, and they understand what's going on in the Catholic churches as the giving of prasad, and they understand that in Hindu terms. Can they receive it as well? And the reason that they wonder this is because, in their understanding, when God blesses food taken into a temple by a Hindu, the Hindu can share that with people of other religions because God's grace and mercy and love are boundless, not limited to the laws of a particular religion. Therefore, they cannot understand why they should not be able to receive Catholic prasad or communion at a Catholic church. And so uh, Catholic theologians in India are wrestling with this question. Now, some bishops actually allow uh, um, Hindus to receive communion. This here is connected to this. This is not a very sharp picture. But this is the, uh, what is called the Lords of India. This is by Our Lady of Good Health at Vailankani, a very famous Catholic pilgrimage site. Most of the people that go there on the major feast days are Hindu. Because the, the Christian population of India is about 2%. But Hindus are eager to go to places like Vailankani in order to receive communion on these special holy days of Mary. And so nowadays, nowadays uh, there will be as many as 200,000 people that will go to this church on the major feast days hoping to receive communion. Most of them, again, are Hindu. Okay? Now, communion there is tongue communion. And that would mean that Hindus would not exactly know how to do this. And this helps the priest to know what to do when time for communion comes. But what they do is they have 15 or 16 priests, Catholic priests, standing up front uh, just before communion, representing all the major languages of India. Because on this, these particular days, people will come from different parts of India to this very famous shrine for Mary. And then the, the priest will say each in their own language, we are now about to receive Catholic communion. Catholic communion is only for Roman Catholics in good standing with their church who have recently gone to confession. It is not for other Catholics. It, it, it is not for Protestants. It is not for Hindus. It is not for Jews or Buddhists or, or Zoroastrians and on and on it goes, who it's not for, right? So you think, well, what's going to happen now when it comes time for communion? after all of this has been said. I don't have a picture of it. But what happens is when the priest says, now communion is available only for those Catholics in good standing with their church, at that moment, everybody gets up. That means all these Hindus, which are 90 or 95% of the people there, and they all go forward to receive communion anyway. Why should I listen to these people who want to block me from receiving the grace of God through this communion? So the priest then goes, he, has the, you know, he wants to give communion, he goes, body of Christ, and if they, look, they don't look like they know what they're doing, uh, he sends them back, body of Christ, no, you don't look like you're a Catholic, body of Christ. And every now and then they're not sure, so they give communion out, right? So the Hindus who don't receive are very disappointed that the Catholic Church put these restrictions on them. But I also believe that on that particular day when I was first there, lots of Hindus received first communion. Okay. Whoops. Another ancient religion in India is Buddhism. It's a small percentage of the population now for historical reasons I'm not going to go into. But one of the places that you'll want to visit when you go to India, not if you go, but when you go to India, is this place called Ajanta. This is a bunch of caves, about 35 caves, not far from Mumbai or Bombay, outside the city of Aurangabad, which are magnificent. Carvings and paintings showing the life of the Buddha and his previous lives as a bodhisattva. So I've taken a couple of classes from Notre Dame, a couple of groups there, and for them it was the highlight of the trip to India was to go there. You can, you can sense the, the, the sacredness of the place even with all the, the, the crowds of tourists now. One of the reasons why Buddhism is still alive in India today is because of a very ancient meditation practice called Vipassana. And Vipassana is taught by a man whose picture I'm going to show you who died last year. His name is Goenkaji. Uh, this is the meditation technique possibly taught by the Buddha himself in order to attain enlightenment. The whole focus of Buddhism, whether it's prayer to the bodhisattvas or whether it's meditation practice like this, the whole focus is this in Buddhism, purification of the mind and the heart. That's the prerequisite for liberation. You have to purify your mind and your heart. And they say, here's a method that works. Try this method out. 
So what I did then, I, I, I didn't know about this method at all. I was living with some Anglican and some Catholic sisters at an ashram or monastery in India. And they said to me, you're going to want to do a Vipassana course. All of the sisters here have done a Vipassana course. And I said, well, I'm here to study Hinduism. Why should I practice Buddhist meditation? Why should I take this course with Igat Puri, with Goenkaji? And the sister said, because it, will it will, because it will change your life, is the way that they put it. So I'm thinking, how can Buddhist meditation change the lives of these Catholic and Anglican nuns? This is the teacher, Goenkaji himself. He's a married man. He's not a monk. Uh, I took a 10-day uh, retreat with him, 400 people there, packed shoulder to shoulder in meditation. And we meditated 13 hours a day for 10 consecutive days. Otherwise, we were in total silence. And our longest session each day was four hours of sitting in meditation, observing the breath and eventually observing skin sensations. It's a very, very interesting and developed uh, science of meditation. And it does work. It brings a certain kind of insight, a certain kind of clarity, a certain happiness, a certain sensitivity to people around you, and even to nature around you. It's like getting time to slow down and to really learn to be present now without the filter of the ego and desires getting in the way. Seeing clearly, seeing into the true nature of reality, and seeing into the true nature of your own reality, and discovering an interconnectedness of all things. There's a movie I'd like to recommend. It used to be that you had to buy the movie, but now you can actually go on YouTube and see it for free. Doing time, doing Vipassana. 52 minutes long. This is a remarkable movie that I show regularly at Notre Dame. It's the, it's the true documentary involving my teacher, Goenkaji, going to a, a, a very important and large prison in uh, Delhi, the capital of India, called Tihar Jail, where there are thousands of prisoners and inviting the prisoners to do this Vipassana or Buddhist meditation for a 10-day course, and how they came out of that course. It's all documented, weeping over their sins. Instead of talking big, I'm going to get even with this guy or that guy, they came out of this course having looked into, their, into the state of their mind and their own suffering and recognizing who they really were. They came out remorseful for the evil they had done simply by doing a 10-day Buddhist Vipassana course. It's a remarkable movie. So maybe you'll want to find time to look at this sometime. This is my wife at 16. This is my introduction to Islam. When I, when I lived in uh, Germany, I supported myself by working in factories uh, for off and on for eight years. They let you do that in Germany if you're a student. At least they did in my time. And my first exposure to Islam was through Turkish Islam, by working with Turks in the factories, uh, working in auto parts factories. But I didn't really have a deep insight into Islam until I went to India and lived really among the Muslims. And so I met my wife when she was about 26. And this is, this is her at 16. Uh, I just wanted to show you the transformation between her at 16 and then uh, at, at the age of 30, uh, after she's married and had a couple of kids. This is a more recent picture. There she is now. Uh, I love the dress, <laughs> by the way. India has all kinds of beautiful cloth in India. So, uh, She's, I call her my guru because she's the wisest person I know. And, I, and I'm not kidding you. She's the wisest person I know. She, she would kill me for saying that in front of you all now. So I'll tell her later, but not now. I won't make a call. And, and here now, uh, this is something that's very important to Islam, is to know the Quran. And it doesn't mean that you can understand the Quran, but what it does mean is that even though you're greeting each other in Arabic, you don't really know how to read the text unless you're living in a country where Arabic is spoken. So in this part of India, they speak Hindi and Marathi. They don't speak Arabic. But these are all Muslim kids, boys and girls together. Notice the smiling face here on the right, little girl. And what they're doing, and this is their teacher in the middle here, she's teaching them how to cite and read the Quran. It's not required of you to actually know what you're reciting. Just be able to recite the words means you're taking these beautiful, heavenly Arabic words taking them into your mouth. You're taking the word of God into your mouth when you recite the words of the Quran. It's the closest thing to Holy Communion in Catholicism, to take the word into your mouth with faith and be transformed by that. So they don't understand what they're reading, but they learn how to say it perfectly. Uh, and so um, the understanding, you know, in Islam is 
is that even though it's good to be able to understand the words of the Quran, but you should understand that, that the words themselves, the sound of the words, are enough to transform you and lift your mind up to God, even if you don't understand the meaning. This is very like some kinds of Hinduism as well, where you can chant Sanskrit, but you don't know what you're saying, but it can also lift the mind up to God. We don't have that in Christianity with our Bible, uh, because in the Bible, everything is focused on the meaning. And that means that the Bible is able to be translated into other languages without losing anything. Because in Arabic they say, or in Islam they say, if you translate the Quran into another language, you lose a lot. Christianity says you don't lose anything with a good translation. And that's why the Bible is the world's most translated book. Because its meaning is not, its value is not dependent on the sound of it. Okay? That's what makes it different. Now, this is not in the book, but this is one of the most famous uh, shrines for Muslim saints in India. It's in Mumbai or Bombay. Notice there's water here. This is a, a causeway or walkway that goes out there. Uh, this is a, a place that is much more visited than even I show it here, where the walkway is so crowded that you have to be careful that you don't fall into the water as you're walking out there, because there's no railings there at all. And so people will go there to visit the shrine of saints. So even though Islam is 13% of the population of India, there are sh shrines of Hindu saints everywhere you go in India. So when I go to India as a Catholic scholar of Hinduism, I spend a lot of time visiting Muslims and getting to know them at their shrines. It's a wonderful experience. This is a little closer look. Again, it's not so sharp. And this is a, the picture taken uh, at sunset. I took this picture myself. Uh, here are people, you can't see it, but a close-up would reveal this is a lot of people still walking toward the shrine to, pay, to pray to God and to ask the saint for intercessions for whatever that they need. Here's another shrine in the city of Pune, a smaller one, uh, not as well visited, but still has an interesting story here. Uh, this is about a woman, this is a photograph of her in the around 1930 or so, a Hazrat Babajan. This is a woman who was a Pashtun princess who was gripped with religious fervor at a young age and decided she's going to renounce the world for God. Her parents wanted her to marry, she ran off. She disguised herself as a man and went on pilgrimage to Mecca unaccompanied by a man. She was very courageous. She lived in different parts of the Middle East and India and she finally arrived in the city of Pune, India, where I lived uh, in the 19, I don't know when exactly, but she lived about 25 years there. And she lived under a tree on the street and she was venerated by both Hindus and Muslims. And they would come to her and ask her to pray to God for them. They didn't say she had power, but the power of God was coming into her or answering her prayers, you could put it that way. So she was seen to be a vehicle of God's grace and mercy. Uh, so she's venerated by both groups. This is where she's buried today. Uh, you'll see here on the top right, this is the, the part of the tree under which she was sitting all the time. It's now covered in silver to remember her. This is a, a Muslim family visiting, visiting the shrine. And let's see, yeah. Now right here, this you can't tell, this, these, are, these are peacock feathers uh, put together. And the, when the caretaker is there, and you come along, and you get very close to where she's buried, this saint, he will take the peacock feathers, touch where she's uh, you know, interred there in the shrine, and then touch your head. So my Notre Dame students were not expecting this. They were just kind of bowing low, and all of a sudden, the peacock feathers were touching their forehead. And he was giving them a blessing. Because the, bless the baraka, the blessing of God, uh, goes from God through the saint to the rest of the world. And why peacock feathers? Peacock feathers represent wisdom and compassion. These are two of the visitors to the shrine. The man on the left is just a regular visitor. The man on the right is what we call a fakir, a man who's renounced the world for God. So he doesn't have any possessions at all, except the clothing on his back. Now, here's another shrine. This is the last of the shrines I want to show you. Uh, this is in a place called Shivapur, outside the city of Pune, India, where uh, a saint is buried from 800 years ago. And the saint was a young man who came from a family of bodybuilders, guys who liked to lift weights. And he was never interested in this. He was interested in learning the life of prayer from a Sufi master. 
And so he ended up leaving his family and going to this little town called Shivapur, where it is said he worked miracles. He prayed, he prayed for the end of child sacrifice, which was then eliminated. Uh, he gave all his money away. Whenever people gave him gifts, he gave this away to the poor. And he also, when he died, just before he died, uh, found two boulders that he left behind as a sign of God's power. I have to explain that, what I mean by that. You'll see the boulder. This is a picture I did not take. But you can see the boulder here in the air. And the understanding is this. When you go to Shivapur, you will see the large boulder there. The smaller one has broken. You can't use it anymore. There's a large boulder of about 150 pounds. And the way that it works is that you have to have exactly 11 men, each of them using only the forefinger of their right hand. They will put their finger under the boulder, and then they will call out the name of the saint. And they'll call out, they'll call out Kamar Ali Darvesh. And they'll call it out with one breath. And as long as they hold the breath that, that sound Darvesh, for that length of time, the stone, which has been raised in the air, will remain there. As soon as one person is out of breath, the stone comes down to the earth again. Now, the understanding is, this shows that the power of God is stronger than any kind of earthly power. And it also reveals the love of God for all people. Because it isn't just Muslims who raise the stone. Other people are also inv invited to join them. So after photographing this and seeing it myself, I heard about this from my wife because she and her family used to go on regular visits there, about a 45-minute drive outside the city. They used to go there, a bunch of cousins and, and family members. Uh, and she, she's the one who introduced me to this. I decided I would finally go myself. I've observed it many times. And then it finally happened that I myself decided to try this myself. And so I went there as one of the 11, the only Christian there. They invited me to join them. And I put my finger under the stone with the other ones. And, and they all started to, to um, call out the name of the saint. And it only went a little bit into the air before it kind of dropped again. And, one, and the oldest man said, he noticed, he said, you were not calling out to the saint. And I thought, he's right. I forgot to call out to the saint. I was only focusing on the stone. So the next time, a moment later, we started calling out uh, Kumar Ali Darvesh again. I, I was part of them calling it. And I was able to lift the stone up over my head. It felt as light as a pebble. And then it finally came back down to earth again. My problem with this is the following. Women are not allowed to do this. And we don't know why. It's been the tradition for a long time, but it just shows that there are these problems in different religions. This is one of the problems. In this particular place, uh, women cannot do this. Now, if you go to a shrine where a woman is buried, a, a Muslim woman, men and women can both go inside to the holiest place. In the place where the men are buried in India, the Muslim men, the Muslim saints, women cannot go all the way inside. So there's a difference there. Uh, but anyway, my wife says, who's now a Catholic, uh, she said, I'm going to go there sometime with 10 female friends, and we're going to lift up that stone, whether people like it or not, is what she says, right? <laughs> OK? So here's a more recent picture taken off the internet. There, there gives you a good view of what that stone looks like. You see? It's quite remarkable. I don't know what to make of it, other than I think it's maybe the, 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 the power of God, as they say. OK, so that's just a little bit of an understanding through my testimony about the holiness that's possible the purity of heart and mind made possible by people who turn toward the ultimate reality. And many Catholics in my classes at Notre Dame, when they come to my theology class, they have come with a false awareness that they think Catholic teaching is that people of other religions cannot be saved. And they wonder why that teaching is there. Because their instincts are telling them, if God is a gracious and loving God, surely these other people, some of whom are from other religions, and that they know well and are better and more devout than they themselves are, how could God reject them? What they don't know is their instincts are right, and they just don't know the teaching of the Catholic Church. So in 1965 especially, there was one particular writing called Nostra Aetate that really is, is um, key for understanding the new Catholic teaching on other religions. Now, the Church had already allowed earlier in history that non-Catholics can be saved by following their conscience, but nothing was said in a positive way about other religions. It was understood that a person following their conscience will be saved not with the help of their religion, but despite the religion to which they belong. 
And now we have that changed in Vatican II. And we hear that it isn't just the conscience that you have to follow, but people who follow their religion to the best of their ability will find their way to God. It's not said that those religions are devoid of error. In fact, the, the Vatican II's understanding is, as I understand it, is that, that other religions have a less intimate knowledge of God and God's love than, than Christians have because we have Christ, and they also have teachings that are mixed with error. Nevertheless, their teachings, their practices, and their values will lead them to liberation or salvation. So we have this very famous statement here. John, how much time do I have left to talk? Are we near the end now? Because I'm, I'm, I'm completely lost. No, I was going to go maybe five or ten only. Yeah, that's great. And then we'll open it up for okay, good. Okay. So here's what we have. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. I put in bold true and holy because the Catholic Church is teaching that there's truth and holiness in other religions. And the ones they're naming are Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Judaism, but by implication they're meaning other religions that are also not named. It's not saying everything about those religions is good. We have a lot of problems with some of these religions more than other ones, but there is enough of God's presence in these religions to lead their followers to, to salvation. Okay? Uh, she regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings which, though differing in many aspects from the ones she holds and sets forth, there is an indication that there are differences in teaching, nonetheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men. Indeed, she proclaims and ever must proclaim Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, in whom men find the fullness of religious life, in whom God has reconciled all things to himself. So what Vatican II is doing is this. It's saying, without sacrificing the centrality of Jesus, we acknowledge now, because we know more about world religions now than we did at the Council of Trent in the 1500s, we know a lot more now about the goodness of these religions than we did before, and we are compelled now to say something that's valuable and true about these other religions that we would not otherwise have said. Now this document was especially, was originally supposed to be a document about Judaism, but then some of the Asian bishops said, we need to speak also about other religions. And so they come actually first uh, in, the, um, in the document, even before Judaism. And here's another uh, document from 1964 from Lumen Gentium. Uh, notice at the beginning, the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. In the first place among these are the Muslims, who, profess, who professing to hold the faith of Abraham along with us adore the one and merciful God, who on the last day will judge mankind. So it's typical of Vatican II and of official Catholic teaching to seek out commonalities and similarities where we agree. And why? Because it's better for world peace that the religions get along. Because the great majority of wars that have ever been fought have been fought in part over religious differences. So Vatican II's documents are sometimes regarded as peace documents. They want to find what we have in common so that we can harness the forces of religion to work together for justice and peace in the world. At the same time, we don't want to sacrifice what is particular and special about Christ, but we do want to acknowledge more than we did in the past the goodness of other religions. Now, a little bit more about Jesus here because we've been talking about these other religions. Let me say a few words about Jesus now. There is no figure in history who has been so acknowledged, loved, and adopted by other religions as has Jesus of Nazareth. The Hindus love him, the Muslims love him, and the Buddhists don't tend to know as much about him, but they tend to recognize his greatness as well. Now, for Hindus, this is one particular way of looking, but it's the mainstream Hindu understanding of Jesus. He's one of many avatars or incarnations, okay? And so uh, he's someone who, whose picture you will sometimes find in Hindu homes. Even though they continue to remain Hindu, they do recognize Jesus as a, a, a genuine avatar that they can also turn to in prayer. One of the things that we're not clear about, and I didn't mention this yesterday, I forgot to mention this, it's when I gave the talk at St. John's, is that we're not quite sure why it is but nowadays, there's a greater Hindu attention to the sufferings of Jesus than in previous generations, and we're not quite sure why that is. I visited a shrine of St. Anthony in the city of Pune, India, where there was Jesus on the cross, not too high up, outside the shrine. I saw a Hindu woman come 
remove her sandals because she's in the presence of the holy. Catholics are walking into the shrine with their shoes on. Hindus are taking off their footwear as a sign of respect. And she puts her hand on the wounds of Jesus on his feet. She puts her head on her arm. And for half an hour with her eyes closed, she is praying to Jesus as a Hindu. This is not unusual. There are Hindus in northern India, uh, Chris Bhaktas they're called, the, the, those who have devotion to Jesus. I'm not exactly sure what their teachings are, but these are large numbers of Hindus who pray to Jesus, who follow his path. Okay, so, but Hindus, when they see Jesus, they regard them and, and interpret him in Hindu categories. They don't see him the way that Catholics do or Christians do, but still they do honor him as a great incarnation of God. And when it comes to Islam, Jesus is one of 25 prophets named in the Quran. And the big difference, of course, some of you will know this, the big difference between the Muslim and the Christian understanding of Jesus is that Muslims reject the divinity of Jesus. And they reject also much about him in the New Testament. They see him simply as another mouthpiece of God who is saying what all the other prophets of the, of the uh, Quran are saying. He's teaching the oneness of God. He's teaching the need for justice and mercy. And he's also reminding us of the coming judgment. So Jesus is not really doing, he's not really saying anything different than all the other prophets. Nevertheless, there, is some, there are some ver many verses in the Quran about his life as well. But what's really important about him for the Muslims is that he's preaching monotheism. But also in Islam, Jesus is regarded as a man of prayer. So the, the mystical tradition of Sufism, they have a very high regard for Jesus as someone who teaches them how to pray. And then you get to Buddhism, and Jesus then is regarded as a, a bodhisattva or an enlightened person who is, com exercises compassion toward the world. Um, but this, Jesus is not as big in Buddhism as he is in Islam and in Hinduism. Going back to Hinduism, here's a very famous picture of, of Jesus and Krishna. Have you seen this, Ted? No, no. This is a picture of Jesus and Krishna that's making the rounds in India the last couple of years, obviously painted by a Hindu, where we have Jesus and Krishna emphasizing the simila similarities and commonalities. Jesus and Krishna are together holding hands. Notice how Krishna is a little bit higher than Jesus is. That's because in Krishna theology, Jesus is a lesser avatar. He's a real avatar, a real incarnation, but he's not as high as Krishna is, you see. And so he's not quite as high depicted in this picture here. Okay. And this is one of my heroes, Houston Smith, that, uh, uh, that John was just mentioning in the introduction to my talk. He's 95 years old now. He is a, a Protestant. He's the son of Methodist missionaries in China. He grew up speaking Chinese. He had a love of other religions from a young age. He comes to the United States to do his theology. He eventually becomes a great scholar of world religions. And so his book, I don't know what the book is called now. It used to be called The Religions of Man, but he got rid of that title because it's sexist. And now it's maybe The World Religions or something, but you can look it up. It's sold a couple million copies since the 1950s. It's the most well-read or most widely read book on world religions. It takes us into what is best in these other religions, into what is great and mystical and beautiful about them. So he's a very affirming understanding of the religions with all of their differences. So he's very old now. And one of the things he's known for is not only to have studied their, these other religions from texts, but also have to have studied at the feet of different masters. And so he studied in Japan with a Japanese Zen master. He studied in the United States with a Hindu Swami, studying Hindu teaching. And he also prays five times a day like the Muslims do, at the same time that he remains a devout Christian. And so the reason I have him here is because I want to show you a quotation of his. I wish I knew where I got this. I can't remember. Um, because he remains a devout Christian. And, and, and so you've just heard now about all these other religions and how God is at work in them. And what should we do with Jesus, right? Should we think that maybe he's not so important? Or how central is he? This is what Houston Smith says for Christians. God is defined by Jesus, but is not confined to Jesus. In other words, if you want to know God's self-definition for us human beings, the will of God in the world is most clearly manifest in Jesus than elsewhere according to Christianity. This also involves his resurrection too as a sign of authenticating and con confirming everything that he's about. But to say that Jesus is defined, he defines God and God's will doesn't exclude the possibility that the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is also at work 
in other religions. That's what this talk is about, to try to show you that. And so the real challenge now is, in, in theology is how to balance these two, to acknowledge God's work outside of Christianity without lessening the value of Jesus at the same time. That's the challenge today. And so I have a number of questions here, and, and we don't have to talk about any of these, but these are just questions that come to my mind. What role do religions play in God's plan of salvation? Does God want other religions to exist? Does it matter what religion you belong to? What is the purpose of religion? Uh, I'm sorry, of mission. In what sense is Jesus Christ unique? And here's a, here's a teaching that's very hard. How is all salvation in Christ, even for those followers of other religions who do not know of him? So it's, it's one thing to say that people are, are made holy by the Holy Spirit, but to make the claim that all salvation is in Christ that the incarnation has an impact on people who never heard of him, that even pre-existed him, is something that I don't understand. Okay? And this is something that theologians are also working on. Also, to what degree do our doctrinal differences matter? In other words, if we have teachings that contradict other, other religions, how is it possible that there's still holiness there? Or maybe, does it matter what we believe after all? I, I personally believe that it, it very much matters what we believe, but I want to make clear that God can work in any situation, even if doctrine is not uh, in conformity with what has been revealed in Christ. Is God creating community across religious boundaries even when our doctrines don't agree? Let me give you an example of that. I received a, a message one day from a Hindu friend, to me a Christian, saying, I'm going to be praying for your mother-in-law because I know she's ill. So a Hindu is praying for, to a, to notifying a Christian that he's praying for a Muslim. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying God is creating community across religious divisions. The spirit of love is coming out more and more now. All religions have their dark side, which we haven't talked about. How is Christ the solution to the dark side of religion? This is a very, very important question that I'm working on in my own mind. And then finally, I want love to be the last word here. So I'm going to show you Bede Griffiths. This is a Catholic priest. How many people have heard the name Bede Griffiths before? Some of you have. Uh, this is a man who was the second most famous Catholic monk in the 20th century after Thomas Merton. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a very famous book about his conversion back to Christianity after he'd fallen away from it as a, teen, as a teenager and into his 20s, called The Golden String from the 1950s. It's still in print today. He eventually, well, he comes back to Christianity through an intellectual path. He, together with his teacher at Oxford, C.S. Lewis, both come back to Christianity together but the difference is that C.S. Lewis remains an Anglican. Bede goes on to become a Catholic. C.S. Lewis also was not interested in other religions, but Bede was. And, and during the time of search, he'd learned about Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam, Taoism as well. And he remembered that after his return to Christianity, that he has to continue to take them seriously after his conversion. And so he's famous for having gone to India in the 1950s. He died in, somewhere in the 1990s. And he wrote very famous books on Hinduism for a Western non-Hindu audience that praised the greatness of Hinduism, but also in the final chapter, he points out the, the incompatibilities of certain kinds of Hindu belief with Christian belief. So he's not afraid to do that as well. So he's revered in India by, by the local Hindus. So on his birthday, a thousand Hindus would come to, to, uh, to celebrate his birthday with him. And this is going to be the last frame. Uh, there's a, there's a little clip of a little over three minutes that you can look up on your own on YouTube. All you have to do is go to YouTube and, and just type in Bede Griffiths or type in Bede Griffiths near-death experience. And what he does in this remarkable little uh, a talk is he talks about how he had a stroke in India. And during the, the moments when he had a stroke, suddenly he had a, a, a deeper awareness of the presence of God as love surrounding all things. And as a result of that, he's arguing or he's, he's testifying that we need not fear death because we're going to fall into the arms of a God of love. It's a very, very powerful piece. And then shortly after that, he did pass away. So I wanted love to be the final word. So that's basically what I wanted to give you for today. We can now open it up for questions and answers. If you have any questions or answers, I don't know if you do. Uh, do we have microphones, or are we just going to have, you can just stand up? It might be easier just to stand up and say it loudly. Do we have a microphone for her? Oh, do you have it? 
And I can't promise you I have answers to any of your questions, but you can ask your questions anyway. Um, I was just wondering when they... Can you hear her in the back? Okay. I was just wondering when they look at differences in religions as a... Who? When educators and people like yourself look at differences in religions, um, yet still common themes running <clears throat> through them, do we discuss the possibility that a lot of the differences just come from social and cultural norms instead of actually? There's, there's, different, there's different ways of understanding where these differences, she's asking where do the differences come from in the religions. I'll have, some of the students will argue against me and they'll say, these, these differences are purely cultural, cultural interpretations, it's all the same experience. And this is something we want to avoid, the understanding that we're all having exactly the same experience. I think our, our experiences overlap in the sense that in all the examples of holiness, we have, we have people who have become free of selfishness and free of all the impurities of their mind. That's where we over, overlap a lot. And the, I, I personally believe that the differences are from God, that God, the, the great mystery of life, has revealed God's self in different ways. But I also believe that Christ is at the center of it all. But here's the problem with my position. If God is revealed in different ways, which is then the source of the different religions, then it would seem that the basic teachings of those religions would also be from God, who is truth, but we notice that the religions sometimes clash. How do we account for the, the clash between the different doctrines if everything is finally from God? And that's maybe where you could say, well, maybe it's a false interpretation of what was revealed. It's just very, very difficult to know. I can name right now three examples of that just to make that very concrete. A, a major conflict, what we call conflicting truth claims between the religions. Um, what would be the major objection of Buddhism to Christianity's teaching? Do you know what that would be? Rejection of what? God. God, the whole idea of God, of a, of a creator God would be one thing. Okay? Islam's rejection of Christianity regarding Jesus would be something I just named already, is that it would be the rejection of his divinity. One of the key differences between Hinduism and Christianity is, at least in official Catholic teaching and Christian teaching in general, is the rejection of the idea of reincarnation. You see, uh, so we Christians believe we have one earthly life, and then whether or not we're one church or another, we believe in a, maybe a, a purgation after death, and finally then oneness with God after death. And so Hindus often don't understand why this beautiful doctrine of reincarnation, would, I'm getting off track, I realize, but I gotta get this in here, why the doctrine of reincarnation has always been rejected by Christianity, and it has to do with the fact that every human being has an infinite dignity and value that is lost when the soul goes on to another body of, uh, with a completely different identity. God wants to preserve the dignity and the value of every human person and calls that person home into final communion with God. This raises all kinds of questions, I realize that, but this is the, the teaching. And you know, as much as I love these other religions, I do agree with a man named Paul Williams, who was a famous Buddhist convert to Catholicism just a few years ago. He was raised Christian, then he left it for uh, Buddhism and returned back. And he says, and he was saying this in dialogue with Buddhism, basically in dialogue with religions that believe in reincarnation. He said, Christianity is the religion of the infinite value of the human person. Christianity is the religion of the infinite value of the human person. And that's actually lost in reincarnation. As much as it's a beautiful doctrine and answers certain questions, it loses that sense of the value of the human person. I just had to get that in there, okay? Okay, who else is next? Okay, good, go ahead. This might be a piggyback on that, but what would be your opinions then on the Baha'i faith? I don't know enough about the Baha'i faith. Uh, I do know that they're very, they're very open to the, to the beauty and truth of other religions, but I really don't know their theology of religions, so I really can't comment on it. I know some Baha'i people in South Bend. They're wonderful people, but we don't talk about doctrine. Okay. Um, my question would be, what have you learned about other religions that have, has, has had the greatest impact in your own practice? Do I really have to answer that? That could take all day. Okay, it's hard to narrow it down to one thing. I think, I think, from Hinduism, I've learned a sense of the presence of God in all things. 
Christianity focuses on the human person in, in relation to God. Hinduism reminders, reminds us that this is a sacred universe, that everything manifests the hidden beauty and power of God. It all, Hinduism also tells us that even though everything that is finite manifests God, the very fact of its finitude and its plurality also hides God too, you see? So Hinduism helps make me aware all the time of this relationship of the finite to the infinite that is all around us. And also Hinduism and Buddhism, they have both taught me to become more of an interior person through the practice of meditation. That's, that's, I think that's what I would say more than anything else. That's what I've learned. Okay, go ahead, you had a question? So, um, based on what you were saying earlier in the lecture, um, Christians seem to have a very positive view of that kind of enculturation of Christ and other religions. But there seems to be a pushback if you try and incorporate other religions in the Christian uh, ceremony. Can, do you think that's a... Are you talking about in India? Yeah. So, You're not talking about in the West, because don't, we don't have too many attempts to incorporate Hindu no, yeah, in India. gestures into... Yeah, yeah. And now I'm guessing that you, you know something about India, right? That you're asking the question. I was just curious as oh. to whether... Um, yeah, this is something uh, that's definitely worth talking about. You're talking about enculturation? Yeah. Okay. So in India, for a long time, after Vatican II, there was the attempt to, to bring uh, Indian symbols, sometimes Hindu symbols, into Christian uh, symbolism, into Christian practice and liturgy. And so, for example, if you go to Father Bede's ashram, well, the man that we just saw a moment ago, you notice he's wearing the orange clothing of a Hindu monk, even though he's a Catholic monk. Uh, they're sitting cross-legged on the floor during mass, as Hindus would do. Uh, there's um, the waving of the lights, or the, the, the candles in front of the, uh, the, the, the blessed sacrament, that kind of thing. A lot of things that, that are done widely in India are also uh, done now by, by Christians of, of a certain kind in India and these ashrams or contemplative centers. But there's two, there's two things also to be added to that. First is, most Christians in India are against this. They're afraid of being assimilated and swallowed up by Hinduism by adopting their, their symbols and their practices. And so they want to maintain as much of a distinction as possible, at least very often, from, from their Hindu neighbors. And so very often when you go to a, a Catholic church or a Protestant church in India, it looks like a Western church. And everything is done in a Western way, okay? That's one thing. Now about enculturation, there is a pushback against it now among many, among many Christians in India. Now in India, the, the Christians are divided up in such a way that about two-thirds of them are Catholic, okay? And so this is where the enculturation especially was taking place. And now we find out, very gradually, but more and more now, that most of the people who are theologians and seminarians, that is future priests in India, do not want enculturation. If enculturation means continuing to use the same symbols and gestures that we've been using the last few decades, why is that? Because these people who are Christian are from the lower castes or from the outcast traditions. Two thirds of the Christian population of India is from the lower caste or from the outcast, regarded as unclean by people of the higher Hindu caste. And therefore they say, we don't want this old enculturation because we're adopting the practices and the gestures and the symbols of the upper caste Hindus who've been oppressing us for 5,000 years. We'll have none of that. If we're gonna have enculturation, let it be through the practices of the lower caste. And not, there's not much of that going on, though, you know, because th there just isn't a lot there to draw on. But for the upper caste, there, is a, there are a lot of rich symbolisms, etc. But I can understand their reaction against this. They want nothing to do with a culture or an understanding of religion which has oppressed them for so long. So the word is no longer outcast in Hinduism, or not in Hinduism, but in India today, they're called Dalit, D-A-L-I-T, which means broken or crushed. This is the name they've given to themselves. These are people who are so regarded as impure that they are outside the caste system. They're not allowed to use the same water that other people drink from at the wells, that kind of thing, you see. Um, and so they're saying, we call, we call ourselves Dalit, to remind people that we have been broken and crushed all these years. But they are gaining political power now in India, and they're, they're becoming a very powerful presence in the Catholic Church. I would say that the great majority of priests of the future in India are gonna be from the Dalit background. Okay, who else, anybody else? Go ahead. Yes. Well, I understand that I really need to get so close to 
I, I think we're going to need a microphone here. I'm sorry. She was talking about, she started off by saying, uh, she remembered what I was saying about lifting the stone. So you can continue now. Can you put the microphone near your mouth? To honor the power of God. Saint. Okay, so let, let me, let me I, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. Yeah, 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 okay. So let me say a couple of things. First of all, the saint is a very Christ-like figure. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, no, so are you saying then that instead of focusing on the saint and the name of the saint, I should instead be focusing on God, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 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 and, and, and I understand that. And when I'm praying, most of the time I am praying to God, right? I'm just doing at this time what other people are doing to see whether or not this power of God is really working through this saint, which I believe that it is. But here's the thing. This is a very controversial practice even in Islam. Islam is divided down the middle whether or not a Muslim should be praying to saints at all or should only be directing their prayers to God. They consider it a kind of idolatry to be praying to saints in much the way that pro some, some Protestants at times object to the Catholic veneration of saints as well. It's just like that in Islam as well. So in my own Muslim family, my Sunni Muslim family, my mother-in-law grew up as a Muslim and she uh, was always taught to go there. We don't confuse the saint with God, but we be they believe that God uses the saint in order to make that grace real through the exam example of the saint. Catholic saints are the same way. They're, they're tangible evidence of the grace of God. But my father-in-law, who's a, I forgot to mention that story. My father-in-law is a convert from Catholicism to Islam in order to marry this woman when he was a teenager. It's a really interesting story. But, but, and I'll tell you if you want, but I don't think we're running out of time here. It's in the book. So, um, so he refused to do it. He says when he was indoctrinated into Islam, he was taught, all your prayers go to God. You don't need anything like a saint. And he says he was worried that people are going to move away from the understanding of God as the source of all power by focusing their attention on the saint. But if a, if a Muslim is doing it the right way, they're praying to the saint to pray to God for them. It's not the power of the saint. It's asking the saint for intercession from God that makes things happen. Now, they didn't decide this on their own. This is a tradition that goes back 800 years, and they simply buy into it. But yeah, there's always the danger of confusing the, the saint with the source of all, the holy of holies, which is God. I, I agree with that. And that's why when I was first ex uh, uh, exposed to this, I didn't know what to make of it. But when I learned the story about the saint, I was more willing to do it. If this had been a story about a saint who had done evil, but he's still a Muslim saint, I wouldn't have gone near it. But it seemed to me that the story of this saint was a story of God's God's grace acting in his life to make him holy, and therefore I bought into this whole, this whole gesture. Go ahead. We're going to finish with this one right over here. Okay, so uh, my question is maybe a little more on like the, the basics level, but what is an avatar in uh, Hindu religion, and also uh, what is a diff what is a Muslim saint as opposed to like a, a Catholic saint um, in terms of like their in terms of in, in terms of the life of a Muslim saint versus the life of a Christian saint the, the qualities of holiness and the virtues are pretty much the same compassion sacrifice a life of prayer a life for others there's hardly any difference there at all um, in terms of the avatar question this is a very very delicate question 
that we have to be careful of if we have Hindus in our presence because they find, they find everything in Krishna to be perfect and therefore there's no need to look elsewhere. Uh, I would look at a chapter by Diana Eck of Harvard in her book Encountering God, the chapter on incarnation and avatar, where she does a very good job of honoring the Hindu tradition but, but pointing out the significant difference with Jesus and the avatars. And she says, with Jesus we have God who is with us in our suffering and who, who passes through death with us. We don't, we have, she says the avatars are larger than life. They come down, they display the power of God, but they don't really show oneness with us. They don't have bodies that are vulnerable, that age and experience pain like human bodies are, whereas Christ was really a human being. So the avatar emphasis is more on the divinity rather than on the humanity. In modern times, the avatar teaching has changed. Classically, we had major avatars coming down from above with a different kind of matter in their, in their body, whether they're human or animal. And in modern times, there's a new understanding that each one of us with our real bodies is potentially an avatar. We just need to awaken to that. That's a new development that says every human being is potentially God. That's a different development. So I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out really the difference between the classical teaching of avatar and the classical teaching about Christ. Christianity teaches Jesus is truly God and truly a human being. The avatars are truly God, but they're temporarily in a physical body that has different kinds of properties than human bodies do. So they're not, it's not really God uniting with the human race or with human nature in the Hindu understanding. But in both cases, we have the conviction that God invisible wants to become God visible. That God, out of mercy and love, wants to be among us to show us the way home again. So there's more similarities than differences, though the differences are crucial. Okay? Well, on behalf of everyone connected with the J. Phillips Center, I want to thank Dr. Mokowski and thank all of you for participating. <laughs> and I want to... I want to remind you that this marvelous book uh, that you got a taste of uh, through this lecture um, is for sale here. I know a few have been sold, but uh, there are more books there. Uh, so um, take a look and good night. Thanks again. It's just a quarter to five. Okay, good. So we have a few more minutes.